a sphere into one side, you get the story of the solar system and the other side. The past, present and future of the solar system. Einstein's next greatest leap was to take an audacious leap from that equation. He knew that that worked for the solar system. It had been shown that his equations described the orbit of the planet Mercury, for example, better than Newton's did. So he had a good theory. Einstein realised this. Why confine myself to the solar system? It's like that great, again, as Bertrand Picard said, that leap, that tremendous leap. What an audacious thing to do. What if I don't confine that to the solar system, but describe a universe instead? Why can't I use my equation to tell the story of the universe rather than just the solar system? Roughly the same thing as far as the mathematics go. So he plucked a, 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 a rough idea of a universe into the right hand side. This is back in 1915, 1916, way before anybody had measured the way that the galaxies move around. And ultimately, a Belgian priest called Georges Lemaitre did the mathematics, and he, he sent a letter to Einstein and said, I've just discovered that your equations, your theory of gravity, based on this simple idea of things falling at the same rate in the gravitational field, predicts that there was a day without a yesterday. Einstein's equations predict that you can't have a static universe. The universe is either expanding or contracting. The story these equations tell is that the universe can't be eternal. Essentially, it must have had a beginning. And Lemaitre found this out in the poetic language. He said, a day without a yesterday. Einstein said to him, your mathematics is good, but your physics is lousy. Because he couldn't believe that his equations were suggesting an origin, a beginning of time. Ultimately, that turned out to be true. Then, uh, uh, Hubble and many other astronomers, shortly after that prediction, made measurements that told them that the galaxies were all flying away from each other, which also suggests that sometime in the past they were closer together. But what I find remarkable about this is that the first prediction of the origin of the universe did not come from big telescopes, did not come from observational astronomy, it came from the minds of a few people who did some mathematics and thought a little bit about very simple things and were led to the description of the universe that, as far as we know to this day, is absolutely accurate. So it's a beautiful story. In the last couple of minutes, I want to get back to that, by the way. I just want to make one little deviation to talk a bit about the solar system. And then in the last five minutes or so, I want to come back to that idea. The origin of the universe, the Big Bang, a hot, dense start to space and time. Is that right? Well, it turns out possibly that it isn't right, or at least the story is more complicated. But just before I do that, I wanted to show you some of the great pictures from solar system exploration. Remember I said that I thought one of the great questions is are we alone in the universe? And I mentioned that the Kepler telescope and others are now being able to look at distant planets to see the atmosphere suggest there might be life. The other great exploration strategy we're pursuing is to physically go to the planets and moons of our solar system. And I think this is one of the tremendously exciting pieces of exploration over the next 10, 15 or 20 years or so. And this is a photograph of Mars. And you'll see a little arrow there, which if you can see, we've got very good eyesight, it says opportunity. That's We've got rovers, two rovers in particular at the moment on the surface of Mars, trying to characterise the geology and the chemistry of Mars in the hope that we might find perhaps that life existed on Mars or perhaps still exists on Mars. One of them is the Opportunity Rover. I showed this picture, this is the picture of the Martian orbit of a crater called the Victoria Crater. If you look at that crater, you see the sand dunes in the middle of it. And they're quite a beautiful thing to look at, because if you look at this next picture, that's a picture from the Opportunity Rover, which is stood on the rim of that crater looking out across it. So you see the sand dunes there. Opportunity is a small rover. It's functioned for decades. We're still in contact with it now. It's a tremendous piece of engineering. Again, what it's found, and what the orbiting spacecraft have found, is that Mars is far from the dead world and that we thought it was even 15 or 20 years ago. 15 or 20 years ago, it was possible to think of Mars like our moon, even if it was an interesting planet once. 
it is no longer an active world. Well, now we're getting pictures like this back from the space probes that are all seen and landing on Mars. This is a picture of a crater up towards one of the polar regions in Mars with ice in the floor of the crater. And that is indeed partly water ice. So we know that there's water still present on Mars now, certainly frozen in patches of ice, but possibly liquid under the surface. That's important. Because everywhere on Earth that we find water, we find life. If there's still liquid water below the surface on Mars, could it be there's life on Mars? That's the question for the next generation of rovers. This is a photograph of a Curiosity rover. Um, when the NASA scientists, Curiosity landed a couple of years ago now, um, the NASA scientists I spoke to said it behaved like a teenager when it landed, because the first thing it did was take a selfie. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a selfie from Curiosity. So this is Curiosity with its robot arm taking a photograph of itself just after it landed on the surface of Mars. Curiosity is roving across Mars, it's got a drill. So it's drilling into Martian rocks. This is a recent picture, actually, of Curiosity drilling down. You see that red dust on the surface of Mars. It's just a sort of coating. Beneath there, you see this grey, blue basalt rock. And again, Curiosity is finding very strong signs that there was water on Mars in the past, and there may still be water on Mars to this day. So the next generation of spacecraft to Mars, one of them is called ExoMars, the European Space Agency mission, are deliberately designed to go and look for signs of biology on the surface. The ExoMars will land, I think, in 2018. So it's an extremely exciting time. The chance that we might find microbes on Mars is higher now in most people's minds than it's been in 20 or 30 years, perhaps at the time of H.P. Wells. There may be life on Mars after all. What's fascinating, though, is that Mars is not the only place in the solar system, to our surprise, that may have a life. This is just a, a picture of the moons, the giant moons of the solar system. You can see their size in relation to Earth, and you can see that many of these moons are planetary-sized bodies with bright, giant, thick atmospheres and perhaps oceans and lakes below the surface. You, Jupiter? as a contingent of moons, which are fascinating, active worlds. Before Voyager got there, we thought they might be dead worlds. Now we know they are far from dead. This is a photograph of the moon Io. Io is the most volcanically active place in the solar system. Not a dead world at all. Here's a photograph taken of a volcanic eruption from the surface of Io. Io turns itself inside out. Every time we fly past Io, this tiny moon of Jupiter, we see activity has changed the surface beyond all recognition. This is a photograph taken by the, the new, a, a video taken by the New Horizons spacecraft, which is going to wake up today, actually. So if you look at the news today, there's a spacecraft on its way out to the outer solar system, which hopefully will be revived from its hibernation today. On its way past Io, it turned its cameras round and what did it see? A volcanic eruption from the pole of the moon. So Io is a fascinating moon. From the perspective of the question, are we alone though? This is the most interesting place potentially in the solar system. This is Jupiter's moon Europa, which is an icy surface. You see the cracks in the ice. But what we now know is that below that surface, there's an ocean an ocean of salt water. There's more water in the oceans of Europa than in all the oceans of the Earth combined. So the next idea from NASA and the European Space Agency is how can we get down? How can we perhaps probe those oceans? Could there be life in the oceans of Europa? It's entirely possible. And then onwards out to Saturn. Every photograph we show of Saturn is, I think, stunningly beautiful. This is a photograph of the Cassini mission. It looks like a drawing or a painting or a graphic. It's not. It's a photograph of those rings I mentioned earlier. 100,000 kilometres of ice, but two metres thick. Delicate interwoven structure in the rings. There's another one. Every photograph you pull out from the Cassini mission is stunning. The planet itself, though, as I mentioned, is perhaps not the most important thing. It's the moons again. This is a very recent picture, released just a month or so ago, from the scene of the moon Titan. It's a mosaic picture, many images put together. But what you see there is, moon, is sunlight glinting off lakes. Those are lakes on the surface of Titan. Not lakes of water in this case, lakes of liquid methane. 
for the Titan, is a cold wall with a dense atmosphere. But we now strongly believe that there's a water ocean below the surface of Titan, in the same way there's an ocean below the surface of Europa. So this is a world with hydrocarbons, with organic molecules, and with liquid water below the surface. Again, potentially, possibly, a home for life. And just one more before I get to the end. This is a photograph of Enceladus, a tiny moon of, Titan, uh, of Saturn. Tiny moon, much smaller than Turkey. You'd fit this moon easily within the country of Turkey. And yet you see that something interesting is happening on this small body's surface. Uh, Cassini was instructed to fly through those interesting things, and you see what's happening. There are jets coming up from the surface. Those are jets of liquid water. So they're, they're ice fountains. So we think that there are liquid water lakes again below the surface of this little moon, with fountains of ice erupting up. Could there be biological activity in those lakes? Could there be microbes in those jets? We don't know. The next generation of mixed missions to Saturn will be equipped to go and analyse those jets to see what's below the surface of Enceladus. And then just while, before we leave the solar system, I want to show you one last picture. This is Voyager's pictures. Voyager, what, Voyager 2 is the only spacecraft ever to make it out this far, the frozen edge of the solar system. This is a picture of Neptune, the great outer gas giant. And I wanted to show you this because I mentioned moons in the solar system, completely unexpected, turn out to be the most interesting objects, the most interesting bodies. Here's Voyager's last picture, Neptune and its frozen moon, Triton. Triton, even though it's out frozen, minus 240 degrees on its surface, is not a dead world. It's interesting. Voyager found geysers erupting up from the surface and dropping dark material onto the surface. And this is a, an artist's impression of what it's thought it would look like if you stood on the surface of this frozen world at the edge of the solar system, Triton, and look back towards Neptune. So, I promised, I hope you agree, that the exploration of the solar system is getting more exciting by the, the minute, particularly this idea that we might find life, microbial life, undoubtedly, not complex life, microbes, on these moons or perhaps on the surface of Mars. But I said right at the start of my talk, I would come back to that last question I posed at the start. What about the origin of the universe itself? What do we know about this? Well, this is that picture. I flashed it up quite a few times. This schematic picture of the evolution of the universe. How far back can we see? We can do experiments at the Large Hadron Collider that tell us about stuff that happened less than a billion of a second after the Big Bang. But we can't see that far. What we can see, though, is the oldest light in the universe, which was released 380,000 years after the Big Bang, not long after. That was the point when atoms formed in the universe for the first time. Before that time, the universe was dense and opaque. Light couldn't travel through it. But 380,000 years after the Big Bang, the universe became cold enough for atoms to form. It became transparent at that point, and that light has been travelling through the universe ever since. Can we see it? Yes, we can, and we've taken a photograph of it. So this is a photograph of the whole sky, which is why it's that shape, it's like a map of the Earth. It's a photograph of the whole sky of the most ancient light in the universe. It's called the Cosmic Microwave Background Radiation. What you're seeing there is the colours represent very slight differences in the temperature of that light. By very slight, I mean the temperature is almost uniform but it varies at a level of one part in a hundred thousand. Those different temperatures correspond to areas of different density in the very early universe. Those areas of different density seeded the formation of the galaxies. So what we're looking at here is the origin of the galaxies and the stars and planets themselves. So it's profoundly important in its own right. This is the origin of structure in the universe. The question then, is what's the origin of these little fluctuations? Where did they come from? And this is where modern physics gets extremely strange and interesting. The theory that best explains those distances in colour is called inflationary cosmology. So the idea is that there was a time before the universe got hot and dense, a time before the Big Bang. What seems to have happened is that during that time, the universe was expanding exponentially fast. 
by exponentially fast, I mean very fast. I mean, it went, the observable universe with 350 billion galaxies that we can see today was at that time way smaller than a single atom. And the universe went from something smaller than an atom to something bigger than the observable universe in less than a million, 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 million to the second. Ridiculous expansion. Exponential expansion. Our theory says that before that time, or when the universe was expanding that fast, before the Big Bang, little fluctuations in energy seeded those little variations in density. And they were frozen in by that expansion. And then for some reason, that expansion stopped. And when it stopped, all the energy taken up in that expansion got dumped into space and time, it heated the universe up, and it formed the particles of matter and the energy out of which we made. So it's a theory of what happened before the Big Bang. It's the only theory we have that fits that data perfectly. So it's almost textbook cosmology. So before the Big Bang, inflationary expansion, it stops, loads of energy get dumped into the universe, it keeps up, we measure that as the origin of the universe. But let me leave you with that, that's incredible in itself. And as I say, that theory matches that photograph perfectly well. So that's textbook cosmology. But let me leave you with this, because there's a fascinating twist in that tale. You might say, well, when did that inflation start then? We measured the age of the universe, 13.798 billion years old. That's the times when the universe was hot. When did this other bit start? Couldn't have been going on for a long time, couldn't it? Well, the answer is yes. We don't know how long that expansion was going on for. And here's the most strange bit of all. All the theories we have, I think that's true to say, all of them, they explain that inflationary expansion suggests something rather strange might have happened. They suggest that the whole thing might not have stopped at once. They suggest that possibly, as the universe was accelerating, the expansion stopped in patches. So you get one little patch that stops and it heats up and it makes a universe. And then another bit stops and heats up and makes a universe. Another bit stops and heats up and makes a universe. And that process may have been going on for a very long time and may still be going on now. So the picture may be that we are riding on the back of an exponential expansion of potentiality of creating universes, if you like. And our little bit of space-time is just one of a potentially infinite number of bits of space-time that are riding on this inflationary expansion. There may be an infinite number of universes like ours in what's called an inflationary multiverse. Now, I stress, that's the edge of theoretical physics. It does fit the data. It's speculative. It's wonderful. What does it mean? I have no idea. I have no idea what to tell you at all. Could it be that we're a speck in an inflationary multiverse? It's one of the most exciting times, I think, in fundamental physics. Just to summarise, we've just understood this thing about the Higgs particle. It raises very profound questions about the physics of the early universe. We've found out that there are multiple Earth-like planets, billions of them out there in the Milky Way, and we have a way of exploring their atmospheres. We're looking for life on Mars, and on the moons of Jupiter and Saturn and beyond. And finally, we have experimental evidence that points us in a new direction in cosmology, that, that's telling us about things that may have happened before what we thought of as the origin of the universe. So, with that, the possibility is a wonderful thank you for the invitation to talk to you. I, I, I had a wonderful visit to Turkey. I wish you all the best at the conference. Thank you very much. Civilization, we might talk to them. My, my great hero, Carl Sagan, used to dream of this. He used to say, Imagine the, the possibilities that you can exchange knowledge and philosophy and theology and science within the civilization. Interestingly, though, I think that the, the view of many biologists now 
is that we were very lucky here on Earth. No, not the only 